And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. We've been in this series now for a while about developing faith for tough times. And, you know, I've been actively serving the Lord Jesus Christ for 44 years. It doesn't seem possible. But since I was 17 years of age, when I gave my heart to Christ, and uh, I've been pastoring now for over 30 years. And if you were to come to me and say, Terrell, tell me, how can I develop a strong faith for tough times? I would suggest a couple of things to you. Number one, I would suggest that every day of your life that you confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. Now, that is very, very important. You know, when I first got saved, you know, it's one thing to pray to receive Christ, ask for forgiveness of sins, and say, I believe in my heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, and I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. It's another thing on a day-by-day basis to keep Jesus Christ on the throne of your life. And I really struggled to do that. In fact, uh, I would find, you know, on Sundays or Wednesday nights or when I was in a youth group meeting, yes, Jesus Christ, I want you to be my Lord. But then I would go back to school, I would be with my friends, and I would forget, really, that Jesus Christ was my Lord. And so I had to, for about three years straight, Every day of my life, every morning, I had to discipline myself to make this declaration and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And literally, I would have to envision myself kicking Terrell off the throne of my heart and enthroning Jesus on the throne of my heart. And, and, and I, you, you say you visualize it. Yeah, I just, I just saw it with my imagination because I am so selfish and self-centered, and I want to be the king of my life. I want to call the shots. I want to be in charge. And I remember as a, as, as a teenager looking up, what does this word Lord mean? Because it's not a word that we use here in America a lot. What does that mean? And I, and I realized that when we say Jesus Christ is Lord, we're saying, Jesus, you are the master. You are our Savior, you are the King, you are the Messiah, you are God become flesh. You know, I love that song we sang that was like a creed. I believe in God the Father because, you know, in the early church, a lot of people couldn't read and write. And so they would come up, the church fathers came up with various creeds and the congregation would memorize them. And it's the way they, they really develop their catechism, develop their, their doctrine, develop their faith in that way. And folks, Jesus Christ is the King and the Lord and the Master of my life. And it's important for me, for my ears to hear me saying it. It's important for other people to hear me saying it. It's important for the devil to hear me saying it. And it's important for you to say it just as well. Can you say hallelujah? I love Kathy. I love my God. God gave me just the, the, the a Mrs. Universe. He gave me the most wonderful woman in the world for me. Amen. And he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And I love my wife and I love my three daughters and I love my son-in-laws and I love my grandchildren. I love my mom and dad. Never dreamed I could pastor a church where they would be. But you know what? As much as I love my family, I love Jesus Christ more. Because he's my Lord. See, they haven't died for me, but Jesus died. He was God and, and fully, fully God and fully man. And he died on a cross. He shed his life's blood for me. And that blood speaks better things than the blood of righteous Abel. That blood speaks today. He's forever seated at the right hand of the Father where he's making intercession for you and me. I'm going to tell you my opinion. And you're welcome to your opinion, but my opinion is that when it says he makes intercession for us, he isn't up there saying, oh, Lord, please help Terrell right now. Oh, Lord, help, help, help him, help. I think that his blood is making intercession for us. I think the blood speaks. 
And the blood will never lose its power. Folks, I I love Florida State football. In the 30 years that I lived away from Tallahassee and St. Augustine, Florida, and in Virginia, and then when we're up on the North Shore of Chicago planning a church, do you know in those early days of ESPN, FSU was ESPN's darling team, and they televised almost every game Florida State played. So it didn't matter that I wasn't living here. I could watch those games. Now, the reality is that there were some days, especially when we were living up on the North Shore of Chicago, I would have have been shoveling snow that morning, and then I'd come on and turn on ESPN, and I'm watching sunny Doak Campbell Stadium, and I'm looking at people dressed in shorts and tank tops, and I'm thinking, Terrell, what are you doing? (laughs) Well, I was here because Jesus Christ is Lord, and He calls the shots. I don't call the shots. Amen? But I love Florida State football. I mean, it was, it thrilled me to no end to have Coach Bobby Bowden speak a couple of weeks ago. And, and he, 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 he contacted me. He says, Terrell, I want you to know I felt so at home at your church. I just love being with your people. Hallelujah. And thank God Florida State won yesterday. Amen. Hallelujah, the effectual fervor prayer of a righteous man avails much. Come on. It's kind of funny, but I, I actually, I, I got a call. This doesn't happen to me often, but I got a call Thursday from a former Florida State University football player named Andre Wadsworth. And Andre called me because we share a mutual friend. And, and, and anyway, he, he gave me a call and, uh, you, you, how many of you remember him? I mean, he played, he was a, yeah, a lot of you. He was a defensive tackle and a defensive end and he was chosen in the first round of the NFL draft. He was a number three, uh, player taken in the entire draft. He was the highest draft pick other than Deion Sanders until, until Jameis Winston was picked number one overall. And, and then he played for the Arizona Cardinals and Brent, did you ever watch him play? You're from Phoenix. Yeah. Anyway, he called, and after we had talked for a while, I said, you know, Andre, I said, the Seminoles really could have used you last Saturday in Louisville. <laughs> he said, he said, my opinion, he says, my opinion is that the best team won that day. I don't know that Louisville would be the best team the following day, but they were the best team that day. Folks, I, I'm not a businessman. Some of you are businessmen and businesswomen and entrepreneurs. But I, I think if, if I wasn't, if I wasn't a pastor, I would, I would like to be an entrepreneur. And, and I don't have, you know, I don't have the money sometimes that some business people have coming in. But I'm going to tell you something I love to do is I, I love to be a good steward of what we've got. I love to invest money and see it make a profit. I don't like to lose money, but I, I do like to, to be a good steward. And I think all of us, we are stewards rather than owners. You say, well, I worked hard and I own this and I own that and I'm worth this much. But here's the reality. You didn't bring anything with you into this world and you're not going to take anything with you when you go. Man, we're just, we're just pilgrims just passing through. And so we are stewards and one day somebody else is going to drive my car. One day somebody else is going to have my bank account. One day somebody else is going to have my home. One day somebody else is going to have everything I've got. Why are you grinning so much, Terry? (laughs) And one day if the Lord tarries, somebody's going to have everything you've got one day. Folks, as love as much as I love to be a good steward, and I believe God's called us all to be good stewards. And I don't really think that God gets upset at what you've got as long as what you've got doesn't have you. You know, see, I like to to invest and make money, but I'll tell you something: I love Jesus Christ far more than I love money and stuff and possessions. Huh. You know, I remember one guy who just, he just really loved to make money and he talked to his undertaker and he thought he was getting ready to die. He says, when I die, I want you to just to, to, to fill that casket full of gold. Just fill it full of gold and put me in the ground. And the, and the undertaker said, why? It's not going to do you any good. He says, you just try it. Well, somehow, some way, this fella passed away and he made it up to heaven and he had his gold with him. 
And St. Peter looked at him and said, my word, why did you bring that stuff with you? He says, well, it was very valuable on earth, and I thought I might need it. And, and Peter says, but of all the things you could have brought, you brought, we, we use that stuff for paving material here. You brought asphalt with you. <laughs> Man, they, they, they paved the streets with translucent gold in heaven. Hallelujah. I want you to, to shout something aloud with me. We're going to shout it three times, and I want you to use your best voice all three times. I'm going to ask you to shout with me, Jesus Christ is Lord. Your own ears need to hear to hear you say it, and other people need to hear you say it, and all of heaven needs to hear you say it, and all of hell needs to hear you say it. I want you to proclaim this with me right now. Are you ready? On the count of three, one, two, three, Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, we're going to do it again. One, two, three, Jesus Christ is Lord. One more time, and doesn't that make you feel good just to say that? Oh, it feels good. See, oh, the Holy Ghost likes that stuff on the inside. Amen. Here we go. One more time. One, two, three. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Woo. Give somebody a high five and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I'd say number two, if you, if you really want to grow a, a strong faith in God that will get you through tough times, you need to learn to say about yourself exactly what the Word of God says about you. You've you got to learn to confess with your mouth the promises that are in God's Word. When, when I went, went off to college, my mom, bless her heart, she would send me a letter almost every week. I could count on it. And Kathy and I, after we started dating, we, we would walk over to the campus post office together. It was a walk of about a mile and went through a little green park area. And I'll never forget, it was about February after I'd entered college in September, about February or March maybe, my dad wrote me a letter. You know, mom always wrote, but dad had never written. That was momentous. And he put a little check in it, too, which was hallelujah. <laughs> but Dad wrote these words to me. He said, Terrell, if you're going to grow as a Christian, it's very important that you say about yourself, you say about your circumstances, you say about your future, you say about your life exactly what God's Word has to say about you. And he says, for example... Philippians 4.19 says, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I didn't know that verse was in the Bible. Kathy and I read that. We sat down at a little picnic table at this, at this park area. It was about 10 a.m. in the morning. We're, we're, we're sitting there, and I said, Kathy, look at this. And she said, wow, your dad must be the smartest man in the world. <laughs> For example... Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And he says, you need to learn to say that about yourself, that God is going to supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. And I held on to that letter. I kept it in my Bible. And, and every morning I'd read my Bible and then I'd read that letter again. And I would start saying, God, you're supplying every need according to your riches and glory. Of course, that wasn't written in a vacuum. He wrote that to the Philippians because they were giving. And it's important that we give first, that we that worship God with our tithes and our offerings if we want to see that fulfilled in our lives. But I, I just began saying it. You know, when I graduated from college and I was engaged to this little gal from North Carolina, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just kept saying that verse, God, you're going to supply every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And when I got an opportunity to become the youth pastor in St. Augustine at Trinity Chapel Church, they offered me the whopping salary of $150 a week, $7,800 a year. Does anybody want to sign up for it? I said, hallelujah. Folks, I knew it wasn't going to be enough hardly to, 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 to pay the bills. 
and I knew I had a wife I was getting, I had to take care of, and her daddy was a successful businessman. And the one of the questions he had asked me when I'd ask if I could marry her, he said, "Son, you gotta, you gotta tell me you're gonna always take care of her. You got, you gotta tell me right now that you're gonna provide for her because she's used to being provided for." And I said, "Yes, I'm getting 150 dollars a week. I'm gonna provide for her." <laughs> But I would never, I would never have accepted that job if I didn't believe that God was going to supply all my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We were there for two and a half years and then we went to graduate school up in Virginia. We didn't have any jobs, didn't know anybody, couldn't even find a, 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 an apartment to rent. We lived in a broken down motel, one of those hotels where the, where the, it's got a pool, but it's got a big crack in the pool, you know, it won't hold water anymore. One of those kind of places where people meet to do strange and, and, and not so very good things in the middle of the afternoon. And Kathy and I are living there, and we lived there for about three months. But let me tell you what we kept saying, God, we thank you that you're supplying all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'd get up and, and go to school and I'd leave Kathy there and she's scouring the want ads. And then she's finally, she, a, 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 a housekeeper would come in to, to work in the room and she'd say, finally, I got somebody I can talk to. And that's what her life was like there for a couple of, couple of months. But, but you know what? God is faithful. When, when, when we'd been there for 10 years and, and, and I'd actually gone to work for the university and was pastoring a church and God put it in our heart to move to a major metropolitan area and plant a church. We didn't know where it was going to be. We just kept saying, I turned in my resignation by faith. And we kept saying, God, you're going to supply every need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Because years and years before, my daddy had taught me, son, you got to say about yourself what the Word of God says. Because there will be circumstances that will come along, and there will be distractions, and there will be pains, and there will be hurts, and there will be needs, and there will be times that it will appear that God has let you down, but God has never let anybody down. He's faithful to those who call, who count on Him and call Him faithful. And we prayed and prayed, and one day, Pat Robertson said to my boss, who was Bob Slosser, he says, Warren Hayes, a member of the CBN board, wants to see a church planted on the North Shore of Chicago, and they came to me. And they said, Terrell, we think this is probably what God's calling you to do. And so we go to Chicago, and I wasn't promised any salary at all. We weren't promised anything. It took all of our savings just to kind of get us up there and to, and to, 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 to rent a house and to try to get established and get the kids in a, in a Christian school. And man, we're just trying to find our way. And sometimes all we knew was Philippians 4.19 is that God was going to supply all of our need according to His riches and glory. And we just kept praying it and we kept saying it. Jesus Christ is our Lord and God is going to supply every need. And faithful is He that has called us who will also bring it to pass. We pastored that church. God blessed it and it grew. And we pastored it for 14 years and then I'll never forget the day that Dennis Gray called. And he says, uh, Terrell, he says, Pastor Brown is retiring. And we think that you're supposed to be the next pastor here at Evangel. And Keith called me as well. And several others, Robert Morgan and several others from here called me. And I says, well, Evangel's a great church, but it's not for me. I don't think I'm for it. Kathy and I actually slipped down here and came into a Wednesday night service and sat in. And Pastor Lisi was teaching on the book of Revelation that night. And we met with the board and I wrote him. I said, I don't think I'm the right person. Six months went by and God spoke to her and said, I did call you to Pastor Evangel. And I remember calling, I think it was Lane Noble. It was the chairman of the deacon board at that time. I said, Lane, have you found a pastor yet? And he says, no. He says, are you interested? I said, well, I said, I think God's spoken to me. But if you've got somebody, you know, maybe I can say God hasn't spoken to me. He says, we don't have anybody. He says, if, he says, if you're interested, come on down. We came. Took a reduction in salary to come. 
And let me say this. Our board takes good care of me. You need to know this. Your church board takes good care of us. But we took a $40,000 cut in pay. And Kathy was still up in Illinois because it took us nine months to sell our house. And the church board was so gracious. They said, Terrell, they said, you need to see your wife at least twice a month. So every two weeks we're going to fly her down here. And every two weeks after that, then you're going to fly up there and spend a few days together. And I really, really appreciate the board making that happen. And folks, they, they certainly have given me raises I don't want for anything. We have a great, great church board. But folks, if I did not believe, if I did not believe that God would supply all of my need according to his riches and glory, if I did not believe, as David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have come. Because I'm going to tell you something, evangel assembly of God is not my source. If you work for the state, the state of Florida is not your source. If you work for the city, the city of Tallahassee is not your source. If you work for yourself, your business is not your source. I'm going to tell you, your source is the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God who says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I learned a principle out of Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. It says, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. I remember my dad, he said, son, he said, son, listen to the words that people speak because if you listen carefully, people will tell you what they're thinking and what they're believing. You know, when, 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 when a person's words are filled with fear and filled with doubt, it's, it's probably that their thoughts are filled with worry and filled with anxiety and it's because they're believing God's not going to take care of them because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But if a person will talk about how faithful God is, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not saying you don't have needs. I'm not saying there's not pain. I'm not saying there aren't problems. But if you'll start declaring, God is faithful. He's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me. I'm going to boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If you'll listen to the words of people, you can tell real quick, not only what they're thinking, but you can tell what they're Believing And what we believe is important because Jesus said, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not. Come on. See, what's going on in your heart is so important. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says will come to pass. He will have. He will have whatsoever. He says, and this is not a, you know, faith in God is not a trick that I perform with my lips, but it's a spoken expression of, of faith in God and the conviction of your heart. What we say and what we think and what we believe are all tied in together. And God gave us his word to get our thinking straightened out. You know, it, 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 I remember as a young Christian reading Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. See, the Greek word for transformed is Metamorpho. Now, what word do we have in English that we get from metamorpho? Metamorphosis. Have you ever studied the metamorphosis of, of, of how a butterfly comes into being? I think we've got a little picture here. I mean, look at, look, 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 look at that little, um, caterpillar there on the, on, on the far left of the screen. And, and look at all the stages that it goes through. Sometimes, man, you may feel like a caterpillar. You may not, you say, I'm not even a caterpillar. You may feel like the egg that the caterpillar comes from. You may feel like something that's just crazy and strange looking hanging from a tree. 
But I'm telling you, God takes something that we don't understand and something that doesn't look so good and he creates something beautiful out of it. There's this metamorphosis that takes place as we renew our minds with God's word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I don't know about you, but before I came to the Lord, my thinking was pretty polluted. I was rebellious, I was angry, and I was cynical. If my parents, who were conservative Christians, if they said, that wall over there is white, I would just automatically say, no, it's not, it's black. How many of the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child? I had a lot of foolishness in me. And man, when after I got saved and came to the Lord, God just had to take His Word as I, as, as I would read it. God take, took His Word and He began just scrubbing my brains. He took a Holy Ghost Brillo pad. Look at that. He took a whole, uh, some steel wool. Some of us, sometimes you just need to go to God's Word and say, God, would you straighten out my thinking? God, use some steel wool on this gray matter if you have to, but would you change me? Would you rearrange me? God, would you help me to think thoughts that you think? Would you help me, Lord God, to have a, a mind that's renewed? Hallelujah. I told you before how, how here I am, a senior in high school, over at Rickards High School, and in the, in a British literature class, the whole class is reading Beowulf or Beowulf. I don't know how you say it. Is it Beowulf or Beowulf? Thank you. I didn't quite hear you, but it, the whole class is reading this old English novel, and they are struggling through it. And I did it for about two weeks, and one day it dawned on me, well, I've got some British literature right here. I've got the King James Version, 1611 Version. So I went to my teacher and I said, can I contract to read a a different form of British literature than Beowulf? And she looked at me, she said, what do you want to read? And I took out my Bible. I said, King James Version, 1611, commissioned by the King James himself. She grinned. She said, that's a very, very good book to read. Thank God for Christian teachers. Amen. Thank God for Christians that are in the school system. She said, amen. Amen. She said, Terrell, I would love for you to contract to read that. Now, they gave us two months to read Beowulf. So, and they would give us reading time in class. And my classmates are slaving away to try to comprehend this thing, to try to understand it. I have contracted with her to read First and Second Samuel. I'm reading First Samuel. I remember the day I was reading First Samuel chapter 17, where David says to Goliath, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day... Not next day, not the next week, not at another time, but this day, God's going to give you into my hand. He's going to give the Philistine armies into our hand. He says, I'm going to take your life. And he says, all the earth's going to know that God doesn't save with a sword or a spear or a javelin, but the battle is the Lord's and God's going to get the victory. I'll never forget. I'm, 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 I'm in class and I am trembling. Under the anointing, I'm trembling with the power of God and I'm looking around and, you know, tears are starting to flow down my cheek because of the presence of Jesus. He was so close and so dear. And I'm looking around and, and, and I'm hoping that nobody's noticing me. I know that they're not having any fun and I'm over there having a revival. Hallelujah. Because this word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns between soul and spirit. And the deepest intents of the heart. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. There's power when you speak God's word. There's not always power when you speak your opinion. But there's power when you speak the word of God. Hallelujah. Look at Mark 16 with me. Verses 15 and 16 and Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach your opinion to every creature. Come on. Go into all the world and preach 
your religious values. It's not what he said. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Number one, I tell you, if you want to have a strong faith for tough times, make the declaration, believe it in your heart, Jesus Christ is Lord. If you have to make it 50 times a day, you do it. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Number two, recognize that you've got to say about yourself what God's Word has to say about you. And number three, to develop a strong faith for tough times, recognize that God will work through your lips. And look, look exactly how that happens. Verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Creature. See, that's the way God works through us. You and I take the gospel to other people. The gospel has to be in our lips, in our heart. That's the way non Christians hear the gospel. Now, Jesus did tell us to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. But it takes more than just praying for the lost to see the lost saved. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes here. We should pray. I pray. I've got lost friends and loved ones. I pray for to this day. I've been calling their names for years. But folks, if prayer, if just praying for the lost would get the world to come to Christ, it would have already happened. So if it, if all it took was prayer, you wouldn't need preachers. If all it took was prayer, you wouldn't need missionaries. We wouldn't need evangelists. No, somebody has got to speak the, the, the message of the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they went forth and they, they preached the gospel. Hallelujah. You say, well, pastor, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I love Jesus, but I'm not a preacher. It's not that hard. Turn to somebody and tell them, say, it's not that hard. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just quickly, let me just give you a little tool. That'll help you. Everybody hold up your left hand. Okay? Left hand. There's a five-letter word called faith. We're talking about faith that'll get you through tough times. F-A-I-T-H. Okay? Here's all it takes. When you share the gospel with somebody, you can tell them your, your, your thumb stands for F. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is available through the shed blood of Christ. Forgiveness is available. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Forgiveness is available, but it's not, here's your, here's your forefinger, it's not automatic. It's not automatic because while God's a God of love, God also says, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. God's a God of love. He's a God of purity. He's a God that's concerned about you. But it's not automatic. The reason is because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not automatic because God is a God of holiness and we're born into sin. So what do you do? This is your middle finger. Some people misuse this finger a lot. You turn. You turn. You turn from your sin because it is impossible for a holy God to allow sin in His presence. And so you turn. There's a Bible word for turn, and that's repentance. We repent. God, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And then you can make heaven your home. Everybody hold up your left hand again. Here we go. Forgiveness is available, but it's not automatic. It is impossible for a holy God to allow sin into heaven. So you have to turn, ring finger, turn from your sins, and then you can make heaven your home. It's not that hard. You say, boy, I wish I could remember that. There are copies of that on the Connection Center. You can pick one up after church, okay? Turn somebody and tell them, say, there's a copy at the Connection Center. Number four, if you're going to grow in your faith, you've got to recognize 
that as you speak God's word aloud, the Holy Spirit will begin to work. Did you get that? As you speak God's word aloud, that's what you say, I want more anointing in my life. You say, I want more of, of God working inside me. Well, as you speak God's word, the Holy Spirit will begin to work. Again, look at Matthew 16, verse 17. He says, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was recovered up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs Amen. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. How many of you want God to work with you? They went out everywhere, the Lord working with them. How many of you want God to confirm His Word with accompanying signs? Amen. Well, folks, I want you to see something. God didn't do a thing until they preached the Word. Try it over here. God didn't do a thing until they first preached the Word. I remember as a young pastor, I, I, I was just going through a, a time of discouragement because it didn't seem like I could preach my way out of a wet paper bag. I mean, I'd preach and I'd, I'd fasted and I prayed and I sought God, but man, nobody was getting saved. No life seemed to be changed. No marriages were getting put back together. Nobody was getting delivered. Nobody was being healed. I mean, there just wasn't anything going on. And I started praying about it and started seeking God. And I noticed this passage of Scripture, it says, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the Word. He confirms this Word. He doesn't confirm my thoughts apart from this Word. He doesn't confirm my opinion. Jesus said, forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in no, no, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. The psalmist said, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Folks, the word is what's settled in heaven, not my opinion. And I was praying about it, and I just, I didn't hear an audible voice, but just in a still small voice. It was like the Holy Spirit said, well, Terrell, just how much of the scripture are you actually preaching and teaching? And so I went back and looked at some of my homiletically correct sermon outlines, and I had a joke from the Reader's Digest, and I had, I had this thought and that thought and this sub-thought and that sub-thought, but you know, I only had like two or three scriptures in there, and I really wasn't preaching the Word. And folks, I, I realize I'm not the best, I may not be the best preacher in the world, but I'll tell you what I try to do. I, try, I, I, I know, I know that we won't grow unless we get into the Word. And so I try to preach the Word and not my opinion. I try to preach the Word because heaven and earth will pass away, but this Word will never pass away. Can you say hallelujah? <laughs> Signs and wonders follow believers who are speaking God's Word. Signs and wonders don't follow believers who are speaking their opinion. God's magnified His Word even above His name. Finally, I would say, if you really want to develop a strong faith in God that will get you through tough times, you need to treat the Word of God with the same reverence that you would show Jesus if Jesus was present in the natural. You need to treat this Word with the same reverence that you would treat the Lord Jesus Christ if he was seated right beside you. John wrote in his first chapter, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word Become flesh. John chapter 14, Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will continue in my word. John chapter 8, 
He said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Hallelujah. Folks, there's a lot of fear in our world today. A lot of anxiety. A lot of worry. As I was preparing for this service, I just felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I heard that whisper in my heart. It says, I want to set some people free of fear, of anxiety attacks. Is there anybody here that say, I've, I've experienced fear? Having some anxiety attacks? Folks, fear is not from God. The Bible says we haven't received a spirit of, of fear, but we received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Bible says that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. First John 4.18 says, Perfect love cast out fear because fear has torment. 1 John 5, 4 says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And what you have to do with the spirit of fear, you've got to, and you say, well, it may not be a spirit. Okay, it, maybe it's a strong emotion of fear. You can't afford to allow that to become a stronghold. A stronghold is a thought that holds you strongly. You've got to deal with it in the name of Jesus. You've got to say, I'm, I'm commanding you, you thoughts of fear, you spirit of fear to be gone right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm commanding it to go. And I thank you, Lord, that I've got power, love, and a sound mind. If, 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 if that's you this morning, if you're, if you're wrestling with this, I just want you to, I want you to come up here because and, and, we want to pray for you. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and His church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.